Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson, and we have an absolutely fascinating guest today, a face that you all will recognize, Brett Baer. And uh, he has a new book out that's called To Rescue the Constitution, George Washington and the Fragile American Experiment. Welcome, Brett. Thanks, Dr. Carson. Thanks for having me. Hey, I can't imagine how you found time to do all of this, but uh, what did you want to capture in this book? You know, this is the fifth of the presidential books I've done, and um, I'm addicted to this process. Uh, It is uh, really enjoyable to dig into nuggets in history that I think show uh, moments in time that are overlooked. I did uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Ronald Reagan, FDR. Last book was about Ulysses S. Grant. And this one is about the founding of our country. After the Revolutionary War, the British are defeated. And uh, the country is really falling apart. We're held together loosely by the Articles of Confederation. uh, And it's not working. They were fighting each other. Um, There's battles. It's dangerous. It's chaotic. And in that moment, uh, it seems like a lot of people at the time say, forget it. Let's just go back to British rule. Um, And that's the point at which the Constitutional Convention is called in May of 1787 in Philadelphia. And they tap the commander of revolutionary forces, George Washington, to head up the convention. He says, I'm going to do it not to tweak the Articles of Confederation, but to pull up root and branch that and start over on a document. And that's the formation of the U.S. Constitution. They hammer it out. They get it ratified. Obviously, George Washington becomes the first president. But without him, I would argue, we would not be here. I mean, clearly, and this history and this research shows he is the indispensable man. Well, isn't it kind of... uh fascinating that he was, there was sort of like a two-tiered military system. There were the kings, royal, and then there were the colonials. And, uh, you know, he was an officer in the colonial, but is it true that he really had a desire to be part of the the king's royal command? He did, yeah. I mean, listen, he was part of the militia in Virginia, um, Back in his life, I uh, took over the uh, appointment from his his stepbrother, and uh, so he fought for the British uh, forces uh, early in his career in the French and Indian War. And um, well, speaking of the French and Indian War, yeah. uh, a lot of rumors uh, floating around there. What 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 was his role in the French and Indian War? Some people say he helped to start it. Well, yeah, there was a, an incident where he uh, kind of screwed up and he attacked a French uh, uh, area that uh, a fort that that was not looking for a fight. And it, it started uh, a lot of the battles that then became expanded into the French and Indian War. He was uh, not a great early commander. He was not uh, a good soldier at the beginning, but he kind of fell into promotion uh, because he stood by his commander, uh, uh, General Braddock. And uh, in his death, uh, Washington was the recipient of uh, moving up the chain and became a a more seasoned commander over time. He actually recovered Braddock's body. Uh, But uh, is it true that uh, he was a courier? Uh, for Braddock and all the other couriers were killed except him. And he had four bullet holes in his coat and two horses shot from beneath him. That's true. I mean, it, at least it's true in what we found. Yeah. And uh, I think that that early research really shows how he was weathered by those early days. Um, you know, if you go back, he's, his father dies at age 11 and he, he grows up fast uh, Dr. Carson, and he becomes a man maybe faster than he, he was meant to be. Yeah. And uh, his mother, was she sort of a she domineering tough. type of uh, individual? <laughs> she was tough. And, you know, that's a, an interesting thread between all these leaders I've written about, Eisenhower, Reagan, FDR, Ulysses S. Grant. All of them had pretty forceful moms. 
uh, that were, uh, but George Washington arguably was the most, and she was um, very domineering. And uh, I can identify with that quite. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the secret. The secret to leadership. Uh, that could possibly be. Now, um, you know, his brother uh, Lawrence played a, a huge role, particularly after his father died. Did he not? He did, and uh, kind of shepherded uh, George Washington, held him under his wing. Uh, when Lawrence dies, um, he obviously inherits um, what becomes Mount Vernon, and uh, that property is really his lifeblood. He wants to go back there every time. He just wants to get back to Mount Vernon and farm and be with his wife, Martha, and her two children who he adopts, uh, Jackie and Patsy, and they... Um, you know, every time you see him getting tapped, he longs for just going home and uh, and actually hanging up the uh, <laughs> the uniform. But he uh, he puts it on and and numerous times in his life answers the call. Well, you know he he was not known for his brilliant oratory or for his prose, but he was a steady individual. He was a very proper individual. He always did things the right way, but uh, what are what are the qualities that made him stand out? I mean, there were obviously a lot of people at that time, sort of vying for the leadership role, mm -hmm. and uh, somehow he emerged from all of that. Yeah, you make a great point. Well, first of all, he was very tall uh, for the time. He was about six, two and everybody else was a little bit shorter, but he stood out in a room. Uh, he also just had this presence, this thoughtful, serious, somber presence that was, um, uh, a gravitas in any room. And it wasn't just because he was the commander of revolutionary forces. It was because it was his presence. He was not the elite scholar that Thomas Jefferson was, or the analytical rigor of James Madison, or the backslapping, you know, gravitas or uh, charisma of Ben Franklin. He wasn't the fiery speaker of uh, Alexander Hamilton. He was different in that way. He was very silent at times, even in this con constitutional convention, but he did work the room after, uh, you know, not in that room, but worked it outside at dinners and other places where he brought people together that were arguing inside the convention and got them to common ground. And that's what I see all throughout this is that, you know, dissent, as you know, is baked into our cake sure. about who we are. Uh, but he managed to get to union, meshing dissent and union and figuring out how to get forward. And that's something to learn from from Washington. Boy, we could use him today, couldn't we? <laughs> Big time. Big time. We could use a Washington. <laughs> well, Are you ready to get back in the, the hunt there? Uh, I'm ready to work behind the scenes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, um, what about Martha? Uh, it wasn't his first choice, was it? No, no. And he was a lover of women. Uh, he, he really had a, he was a kind of a ladies man early on, but, um, he had his heart broken a couple of times and, uh, wrote about that in, in poems and other things. He, uh, he was smitten with Martha from the very beginning. Um, she was obviously a, a widow. Um, and, uh, he called her, you know, she was diminutive. She was not tall. She was small, but, uh, she was, beautiful. And he talked about that a lot. She ended up burning their letters after his death. Uh, but they had a lot of correspondence back and forth by all accounts. And um, he considered her a really close confidant and wanted her at his side at all times, even in Valley Forge in the middle of the war. And then when he becomes president in New York, he goes and she stays back and is taking care of the grandchildren at Mount Vernon. And he longs for her and tells his uh, assistant, his aide, uh, that he needs to get Martha up there to New York. So they come up with this, this scheme. She loved seafood. And so they write a letter and say, Mrs. Washington, just so you know, we have oysters and shrimp out every night. And they lure her to New York with seafood. She eventually leaves Mount Vernon mm -hmm. and gets up there. But he was, she was really crucial yeah. to who Washington was. Absolutely. Now, can you sort of set the scene for the, the Constitutional Convention? I mean, the war had been won. 
And uh, there are a lot of people who had different ideals of, of what should be done. Um, and it was pretty contentious what was going on at that time. We think things are contentious now, but it uh, sounds like that was pretty bad back there too. It was really bad and it was falling apart. And um, the country was just not being held together by the Articles of Confederation. It was it was being ripped apart, actually. And uh, that is the environment in which this convention starts. And when the delegates get there, they automatically, you know, there is this sense that maybe it's just not going to work. Uh, and numerous times throughout, they almost say, forget it. Um, you know, Benjamin Franklin has this great quote as they're signing the U.S. Constitution in which he talks about the chair that Washington sat in at the top, at the front of the room in Independence Hall. And it's carved with the liberty pole and a cap signifying liberty and then a, a sun. And Benjamin Franklin says, I've often wondered whether that sun was setting or rising. Thank God it's rising Absolutely. at this moment as they're signing the Constitution. Well, speaking of Benjamin Franklin, um, you know, he was the 81-year-old senior statesman during that time. Is it true uh, that things got so contentious that he actually stood up and said, gentlemen, stop. Let's get down on our knees and seek wisdom from God. And they, they actually prayed. Yes. And that's noted. Um, in the in the research that we've we've seen, and uh, Walter Isaacson writes about that moment in his his book about Ben Franklin. Um, I, I think, you know, I know you are a godly man and a religious man, and I am uh, seek that as well. And I think that you can't look back at our history and our founding without believing that there is divine intervention here, because um, we it might not have happened. We just were not going to get to the starting line. Um, but this group of men, this time, this leader in Washington, um, there had to be divine intervention uh, to Absolutely. start this country. It really had Well, to for be. a bunch of ragtag militiamen to defeat the most powerful military force on earth, the sun never sets on the British Empire. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was sort of like Cuba beating the United States. <laughs> That's Which right. today they might be able to, but uh, you know, it's really amazing how Washington was able to to take these people who really had little in the way of training in the beginning, and to whip them into shape and to be able to do stuff. Now, I've heard some pretty amazing stories, like uh, in the Battle of Long Island, he was down to his last battalion and. Uh, General Howe had him surrounded, and he was surrounded at sea. And then a mysterious fog came down and lingered not only all night but into the next day, so that his men can escape. Have you have you seen the, seen that? Because many of the that records that actually verify it. Yeah, no, it's it's the research is there, and then they write about it at the time. Um, I don't think it's mythology. It seems like it's first person. And um, there were multiple times in the war that it seemed like uh, they were down and out. I mean, Valley Forge is a crucible uh, for Washington, and that force is just on its last legs. They can barely feed themselves, and and he tells them to build shelters in the uh, really brutal cold of winter in Valley Forge, and the, the clothes are kind of falling off, the ratty clothes, and, and some of them don't have shoes, and they have bloody feet in the snow, and yet he still infuses in this man, these men inspiration that liberty is worth fighting for and that they can do it. Uh, he brings in a trainer, a former Prussian trainer, von Steuben, uh, who trains these forces and miraculously, you know, the British are, are kind of lazy in Philadelphia. They're feeling, they're getting fat, uh, just hanging out mm -hmm. through the winter. And this force in the spring ends up beating them. Absolutely. It's, it's an amazing story. Well, you know, Washington already had the stature for pulling off the impossible uh, during the war. So I guess that gave him a real advantage. And then the Constitutional Convention, getting people to to actually come together, that was another miracle. And then thirdly, by voluntarily stepping down, 
uh, after two terms when people wanted him to stay uh, is pretty amazing. But did he even want to do the second term? He didn't. Um, he, he really wanted to go back, uh, but he felt it was uh, a very dangerous time. He thought that he should continue. Um, you know, it's interesting the the press lauded him and lifted him up like a godlike figure. Uh, and then in the second term, they really hammered him. <laughs> and so that's a very familiar uh, yeah. theme, isn't it, of the media. But, um, you know, I think an important thing is that nobody was writing a, a note in the Oval Office desk for him telling him what to do. Uh, no torch was passed. He was the torch. And so he formed the executive. And you're right to point out that by stepping down at the end of that second term, that was his biggest moment to say, I am not an indispensable man. And that formed the peaceful transfer of power that we have to that this day. And obviously it's been disrupted a couple of times, but it's really who we are as a nation. And, and that's what this book does is, is try to put you in the room. Try to put you in the in the moment, yes. and I think it's really important, especially for younger generations, to understand who we are because that's getting lost. And I know you've talked about this a lot. Yes. It just is getting lost in our schools yeah. and our history. Well, you know your your history is the basis of your identity, which is the basis of your beliefs. So obviously, if you mess that chain up, you got a real problem. Yeah, and. Uh, we do have a problem. That's why we really appreciate people like you who go in and delve into the, the deep depths of history. And, you know, our history as a nation, it's not all good. Uh, there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. But the fact of the matter is, there's a heck of a lot more good than there is bad and ugly. And we've got that's right. all these people trying to take the bad and ugly and make that seem like that's the basis of who we are. What a bunch of garbage that is. When I was a kid, you know, there was Walter Cronkite and there was Huntley and Brinkley and there were all these people. And uh, they were pretty much all left-wing radicals, but you would never know it. Uh, they were very even-handed in the way that they presented things and very logical. And uh, I have to ask you before we go on with George Washington, um, is it possible that we could ever get back to the to that kind of situation or uh, has the die been cast and are we no longer able to be objective? I think it's a great question. It's a question I get around the country as I travel a lot. And um, listen, I think that there is a hunger for just straight news. Uh, I think that there is a void uh, because more and more of our media now is going for clicks and going for uh, reads and going for viewers uh, to stir up one base or another. Right. And I'm still of the mindset and my mentor and friend, Britt Hume, um, was the guy who kind of got me in this position. And I'm of the mindset is if you build it, they will come. And uh, I think that, you know, even for the people who don't watch Fox and don't watch my show, I say watch three times and then drop me a line and see what you think. And the people who do that say it's fair. So that's what I'm going at every day, Dr. Carson. I'm just trying to, at the end of the show, say, could somebody watch that and say, I got what is happening in the U.S. and around the world. I have a perspective on things. And it was fairly done. Well, how, how can the journalism majors survive uh, in an environment where their professors would likely punish them if they uh, don't carry the right torch. I think it's sad, but it's true. It's, it's, it's not working the current way we have it. And um, we have to create a farm club that really cares about just news uh, in a fair way. And, you know, Fox was started. I started right after the beginning, 26 years ago, I, I've been at Fox. And, you know, the theory was it was, it, to provide a balance to what was this other media out there. And all the people who covered media said, this is such a niche market and it's just not going to work. Uh, it turned out the niche was half of the country. And so we were providing balance. I, I still look at that today. Yeah. And I, I come from the mindset of we report, you decide. And, and that's what I'm doing. I have horse blinders on for one hour, six to seven Eastern. Well, we're, 
We're very glad you're there. <laughs> now, Thank you. Thank you. you know, back to uh, to George Washington, uh, who was one of my favorite presidents. Um, what was his leadership style? How in the world was he able to get all these factions to cooperate? It's fascinating to to try to delve into. He he was not a big speaker. He wasn't a grandstander. He wasn't. Uh, he actually did more with silence than he did with talking. Uh, he did weigh in different times, but his his leadership style was really to listen first. That was what I think he he did. He listened to all sides, and then and had them argue. Uh, but then came to a conclusion and managed to say, here's what's right, here's what's wrong. You know, Dwight Eisenhower was arguably our most bipartisan president, worked with Lyndon Johnson and worked with Sam Rayburn and did some really big things, including our highway system and all kinds of big legislation. And what he was saying in his farewell address, which echoed Washington's farewell address, was we should agree on what we agree on first and then argue about what we don't agree on. Uh, and Washington came from that same mindset, I think, and um, managed to get things done. There was so much stuff going on in the country at that time. What were the issues that created the the great conflict during the Constitutional Convention? Why couldn't everybody just say, let's get along? Yeah, there was obviously uh, some big issues. Some of them we're still facing today, and that is uh, states' rights versus federalism. What was the role of the federal government going to be? How powerful would it be? Um, there was concern about representation of big states and small states and what that would look like. Mm. And then what the executive looked like. It was, you know, even just down to what you called the executive of the country. You know, there was a battle, even in the smallest things. John Adams thought that it should be much more regal. And he had this name. He said, we should call this the His Highness, the President of the United States of America and Protector of the Rights of the Same. <laughs> and James Madison looked at him and said, are you kidding me? We just got finished with a monarchy. We can't call this person that. And so George Washington gets them together and says, just call it the president. <laughs> and uh, they come to the title. But even in those, those things, they were battling. Uh, really amazing. Now, what's, what was the significance uh, of the country of him voluntarily stepping down after the second term? It sent a message around the world that if any person uh, thought that they could continue, it would have been George Washington. He was, you know, the commander of the Revolutionary War. He was the guy who got everybody hammered on this this document and got it through, uh, got it ratified with the help of others. Obviously, he was through two terms as president, and nobody thought that there was another person that could step to that mm -hmm. that moment. And yet his biggest moment was to say, I'm done. And it wasn't because he desperately did want to get back to Mount Vernon, but he also thought for the good of the country, other people should step up. And then it was obviously John Adams' turn uh, to be in that spot. And there's this great moment where the inauguration of John Adams, uh, they're walking out of the room and uh, John Adams steps aside to have Washington go first. And Washington turns to Adams and says, no, you are the president now. You lead the way. Hmm. And he steps aside and Adams goes through the door. So, the, you know, he knew and, and one of the things about Washington that's so underappreciated, I think, is that every job he came to, Dr. Carson, he said, you know, I might not be the guy. Right. I might not be the one for this job. I, I might not be the best. And, of course, he was yes. the best <laughs> and the right guy in every moment. Well, what can you tell us about his faith? He didn't wear his faith on his sleeve. He didn't, he didn't talk about it a lot, but he was a faithful man. And he purposely made a 
purpose of going to St. Mary's Catholic Church before the convention started. Uh, he was a Presbyterian, and he, but he wanted to make the case that different denominations, it didn't matter, that faith mattered. And uh, that was his message in going to that church right before the start of the Constitutional Convention. Um, he felt like no person, person should be uh, told uh, what denomination they should be or how they should practice, but he did believe and was a faithful man. He was an incredible man. I, I've looked at some of his writings where he frequently talks about the providence of God, God and how that, uh, how he was seeking uh, that kind of wisdom and direction. And I suspect that there's a lot of things that some of the people who are running for president today might derive from what he did. Was was that one of the reasons that you wrote this book? <laughs> yes, it really was. It really was. I mean, I, I'm not going to shy away from it. I, I do think that there's lessons to learn, as you know, from history. And um, I, my hope is that some, some younger person uh, reads this and says, I want to be, you know, George Washington. We could use a Washington or two. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You know, I'm worried about the young people today. What do you think they should know about George Washington? Because, uh, you know, our history books are, they, they used to actually contain some of the stories we've talked about uh, in, in elementary school. And they told people things that really inspired them. And we've kind of taken all that stuff out and said, no, we can't be teaching the kids that stuff. It's um, it's sad. I actually think, um, you know, I think kids should know that um, I think we should embrace history and not erase history. I think that um, we should know that there were dark times and there were mistakes and there were problems, but that we as a country evolved um, and got better. We still have evolving to do to be a better union. Um, but there were great, great men who started this country. We're the only country in the world who had a civil war uh, to fight slavery. Um, we're the only country in the world who evolved uh, from this uh, to the point that we are. Now, there are tweaks that can be made, obviously, to the Constitution. It's been amended 27 times, but it is a document that has survived the test of time. And, you know, Dr. Carson, at the end of this book, there is this study that the National Constitutional Center does about a couple of years ago. And they bring scholars together from all different sides, progressives, conservatives, libertarians. And they say, tear up the Constitution and try again. See what you come up with. All right. And all three of those come back to the Constitution and the document. Now, the, the libertarians say every page should end with and we mean it. And the conservatives have a problem with executive and, and the misuse of executive orders. You know, Washington wrote eight executive orders. I think FDR had 3,200. Um, and then the progressives have a pro problem with the Electoral College and think it should be ranked choice. They all think that there should be 18-year term limit for Supreme Court justices. Those are the tweaks they make. But for the rest of it, they come back to the Constitution. And think about that. In the hall there in 1787 is hammered out a document that to this day, scholars, experts are coming back to you and saying, this is the best. Yeah. Um, it's pretty powerful. And I think kids should realize that we're really blessed to be in the place that we're in. Well, we are uh, indeed fortunate. And we're fortunate to have uh, individuals like you uh, who tell the truth and uh, disseminate the kind of information that allows us to do well. You know, the people who formed our country, they were really quite amazing people. They were geniuses. They, they studied every other government that had ever existed, and they extracted the good things. They were eclectics. And, um, you know, they put together something that is truly, I think, inspired there are a lot of people who think we can't keep it. We've kept it for over 240 years. 
in closing, what would you say about the American experiment today? I think it's still fragile, but it's less fragile than it has been in the past. And uh, we have to, you have to tend to it. You have to make sure that it's, it's firm and, and it's backed up. And part of that is understanding where we've been. And uh, our history and knowing history is a big deal. And, and think about all of the dark times in our past where it's almost fell, uh, fallen apart, even at the beginning where we almost didn't get to the starting line. But the Civil War, after the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant holds the country together from falling back into a civil war. The riots in the 60s, the 70s. Think about all the dark places we've been and we've managed to get through. Um, so... I think that there is some hope there that through the dissent, we can get to union. Absolutely. Well, there's lots of hope. I see people doing good things out there, people like yourself. And, uh, you know, one important thing I think for people to understand is that we've always had controversy. But uh, one of the differences is we kind of wanted the same thing. We just had different ways of getting there. Yeah. Now, maybe there are some who want something different. But uh, we're all going to have to do our part, recognize that we have to be brave. We have to stand up for what we believe in. And we have to learn from the past. You know, the difference between a wise person and a fool, a fool tries to change his history, and a wise person will learn from it. And thank you, because we're learning a lot from what you did. Thank you, Brett, for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. 